Hi! I'm going to record all of the last three lectures in one video. So we're going to talk today about the symptoms, um, the history, and the etiology of substance use disorders, and at the end, touch a little bit on the treatment. So in this lecture, lecture 31, um, I'm going to go over some of the biology of the substances that are considered drugs of abuse and talk a little bit about the history of how we classify and understand those drugs. The piece of the etiology that I'm going to talk about in this lecture has to do with the perpetuation of substance use. So a little bit of history about changes in our diagnostic criteria for substance use disorders and um, a little bit of cognitive psychology and biology about where tolerance and withdrawal um, come from. And then in the next two lectures, I'm going to talk a little bit more about predisposing factors, precipitating factors, and perpetuating factors of substance use disorders. Okay, so the psychological definition of a substance and the definition that we're gonna be using in these lectures is any natural or synthetic product that influences a person's behavior, their thought, their emotion, or their perception. Substances that do these things that interact with our nervous system are known as psychoactive because they have psychological effects. So the substances that we take exogenously have a psychoactive effect because they are able to communicate with endogenous receptors on our neurons. And they do this because they mimic the shape of endogenous neurotransmitters, neurotransmitters that our own bodies produce. Or they have a shape that allows them to interact with receptors on our neurons in some other way to influence by either magnifying or decreasing the action of endogenous neurotransmitters. So two examples of this that are a little bit different. So ethanol is the psychoactive ingredient in alcohol. It's the molecule that gets you drunk. And ethanol interacts with the GABA receptor, but it doesn't directly bind to the GABA receptor. What ethanol does instead is it binds to a different part of the receptor that allows endogenously produced GABA neurotransmitters to bind more competitively and to have a stronger effect on the receptor that they bind to. So ethanol doesn't mimic the shape of GABA, but it still agonizes GABA by enhancing its activity at its receptor site. THC, on the other hand, the THC that we um, consume by smoking or eating cannabinoid products, has the same shape as the endocannabinoids, the natural cannabinoid neurotransmitters that bind to cannabinoid receptors in our body. So THC molecules bind directly to endo, sorry, endocannabinoid receptors on our cells, and they have the same effect as our naturally produced endogenous cannabinoids. So there are five categories of substances, which are basically just divided up based on the psychoactive effect that they have. So depressants like alcohol, benzodiazepines, quaaludes, and Z drugs, so Zolipidem, Ambien, and other sleep aids, um, work through behavioral sedation. So they interact with neurotransmitters or receptors that um, have a depressing effect on our nervous system, like ethanol interacting with the GABA receptor. Stimulants have the opposite effect. They work to increase alertness and elevate mood. Um, by binding to dopamine receptors in the case of cocaine or crack um, or amphetamines, or by binding to nicotinic receptors in the case of nicotine. Nicotinic receptors um, enhance neural activity also. Opiates bind to endog endogenous opioid receptors, um, and they have the same effect exogenously that our endogenous opioids do. They help to relieve pain, um, so they provide analgesia and they improve our mood. They promote a feeling of euphoria. Hallucinogens are any drug that alters our sensory perceptions in any way. So LSD, marijuana, ketamine, MDMA, all of these drugs work by altering the way that we experience sensations. Um, and then there's this kind of other category that are just drugs that don't fit into the other four. Um, and these include mostly things like inhalants, um, so like keyboard cleaner and paint and anabolic steroids. Okay, so a little bit of history. Substance use is very, very old in human history. And there's also evidence that humans aren't the only animals that enjoy um, the psychoactive effects of naturally occurring substances. So elephants, for example, have been known to eat fermented fruit because fermented fruit gets them drunk. Um, so we know that humans have had this relationship with substances since even before agriculture. But of course, when we started to intentionally cultivate plants, 
we cultivated them in such a way that their psychoactive properties became stronger and stronger um, after agriculture was developed by humans. So for example, mescaline, which comes from cactuses, um, has been used in religious rituals in Native America for thousands of years. Cannabis cultivation, so intentional agricultural production of cannabis, started in Asia um, in around 500 BC. But because people were intentionally cultivating it then, that implies that people had been using it um, when they found it in the wild a lot longer. Um, cacao, which is what this figure is showing, um, was first domesticated even longer ago than cannabis, but even before it was domesticated, um, South American and Central American hunter-gatherers have been using it for its stimulant effect. Um, and alcohol may be the oldest substance that humans have a relationship with. Um, the earliest, um, God, sorry, it's early um, archeological, I kept wanting to say architectural, the earliest archeological evidence of alcohol consumption dates back all the way to 10,000 BC during the stone age before humans were cultivating plants at all. So our relationship with substances is really old. It's basically just a part of human nature and maybe not just human nature, but animal nature too, to enjoy altering our thought, behavior, cognition and perception with substances. Our modern attitude towards substances as kind of inherently dangerous, inherently bad, um, is a more recent invention in human history. So there was no regulation or criminalization of any drugs, including medicines, until the 1900s. So during the 1800s and earlier, especially in the United States, but also in Europe, Asia, all over the world, um, drugs like heroin, cocaine, hemp, which um, can sometimes contain THC, alcohol and nicotine were all commercially produced and they were all used for both medicinal and recreational purposes. Um, the people selling those drugs didn't really make a distinction between how they were going to be used. So in 1906, so at the beginning of the 1900s, um, Congress in the United States passed the Pure Food and Drug Act, which among other things was, it was basically intended for consumer protection. It was meant to require people that produced medicines to um, clearly state on the label what they contain. So obviously this type of consumer protection was really necessary for lots of other reasons to make sure that medicines actually contained active and safe ingredients. But it was partly aimed at concerns about people abusing over-the-counter medicines that contained cocaine and heroin. So uh, medications containing heroin were used for pain relief, like um, these toothache drops. And medicines containing cocaine were used also for pain relief for um, stimulation and for things like cough suppression, because stimulants can temporarily suppress coughs when you have a cold. Um, so in 1914, the Narcotics Act was passed kind of on top of the Pure Food and Drug Act to increase the regulatory um, control that the government has over drugs. And this was when the modern system of scheduling was created. So schedule one, two, and three drugs um, organized according to their supposed addictive potential and dangerousness. Schedule one was developed for opium and cocaine. So the same products that were being abused in over-the-counter medicine. Marijuana wasn't scheduled until 1937. Um, and if you're interested, I can post a John Oliver video on the um, racist history of marijuana prohibition. So in addition to creating the scheduling system, the Pure Food and Drug Act and the Narcotics Act also created um, an agency to enforce the rules that these laws codified. And that was when the Federal Drug Enforcement Administration was first formed, the FDA. Okay, so we're gonna talk a little bit and your um, reading assignment involves the war on drugs that started in the 80s and really ramped up in the 90s in the United States. But arguably America's first war on drugs happened um, much earlier than that. So in the late 1800s and early 1900s, there was a very large anti-alcohol movement that had its roots in both moral arguments. So drinking is sinful, it's, um, on Christian, it promotes other sinful behaviors like lust and gluttony and sloth. Um, and anti-alcohol reformers also made economic arguments. So to appeal to bosses and corporations, the argument was that when workers 
drink in their own personal time, it makes them less productive on the clock. Um, and also there was even a feminist argument against drinking um, based on the idea that husbands and fathers who drank alcohol were more likely to abuse their wives and children and financially or emotionally neglect their families. So the efforts towards alcohol prohibition brought together a pretty big coalition of people with lots of different motivations. You had Christian reformers, feminists, and business owners all pushing to make alcohol illegal in the United States. So the 18th Amendment to the Constitution was actually passed in, or ratified by the states in 1919, um, making it federally illegal for alcohol to be produced, sold, or consumed in the United States. Of course, as we know, um, making alcohol illegal didn't make people want to drink any less. And instead, it actually created this huge demand for alcohol that was met by the rise of the first drug gangs, essentially, organized crime. So seeing that prohibition really didn't work that well, it didn't stop people from drinking, it didn't reduce crime, and in fact, it increased crime by creating business for um, organized crime and gangs. Um, and based on arguments that it's unconstitutional to police what people do in their private time, Congress and the states voted to end prohibition in 1933. And this was when alcohol became regulated and taxed and um, sold the way that we sell it now, um, not accessible to minors. The age of being considered a minor for alcohol has changed over the years um, and taxed more heavily than other consumer goods. So the modern war on drugs, like I said, is the topic of the podcasts that I'm gonna have you guys listen to for this lecture. Starting in the mid to late 60s and early 70s, America started becoming more and more fearful about the social impact of drug use. And this fear was escalated by the Vietnam War. So um, people were being drafted and sent to Vietnam where they were being exposed to a lot of heroin use. And there was a lot of concern that traumatized soldiers would come back addicted to drugs and basically society would collapse. That didn't really happen for reasons that the um, video I'm gonna have you guys watch, we'll get into um, for the next lecture. So in 1970, President Nixon signed the Comprehensive Drug Abuse Prevention and Control Act, which increased the federal government's regulatory ability um, to regulate plants and chemicals. So it basically gave the Federal Drug Enforcement Agency more regulatory and enforcement power. In 1984, under Ronald Reagan, um, criminal sentencing reform laws were passed, which imposed really harsh mandatory minimum penalties for the possession, sale, and use of certain drugs. And as you're going to um, read about, listen to uh, on podcasts for this lecture and read about for the next lecture, the enforcement of this was done in a really racist way. And in fact, the laws themselves were racist because the, pen the mandatory minimum penalties for crack cocaine were much, much harsher than the mandatory minimum penalties for powder cocaine. And use of these two different types of cocaine really broke down along pretty much racial lines. So sentencing reform, among other things, created um, this ability for the government to basically steal Black people out of their communities put them in jail for a really long time and kind of caused the total collapse of a lot of these black communities through this unfair, overly harsh sentencing. So sentencing reform like this was really popular at that time because in the 70s and 80s, due to economic conditions, um, inflation, unemployment, economic stress, and um, the fallout of the Vietnam War, there was a lot of crime during this time. So these high crime rates made tough on crime policies more popular at the federal level and at the state level too. So that's what prompted the 1984 sentencing reform bill. It also prompted the federal 1994 crime bill signed by President Clinton, which didn't impose mandatory sentencing like or increase mandatory minimums like sentencing reform, but it did give states financial tax incentives to build more prisons and also reduced the ability of people who were incarcerated to get parole. It made parole much harder to get um, under the guise of transparency. But basically it created a system where parole decisions became really public and the, the public had a lot of say in resisting 
certain people getting parole. So we know that prohibition of alcohol didn't work. Um, there's also plenty of evidence that increased criminal enforcement and penalties for other types of substance use also don't work. So this graph shows the US state and federal prison population going back from, to 1925. And we can see kind of modest increases up until 1971 when the year after um, Nixon's drug reform laws were passed, Nixon officially declared the war on drugs. He made it the government's priority to police and punish people's use of illegal drugs. So after this point, we've seen a huge shocking increase in the prison population, um, which was only escalated by sentencing reform, which imposed mandatory minimum sentences for a range of drug offenses, but particularly for offenses involving crack cocaine. So we know that the war on drugs has increased incarceration, but has it actually decreased the prevalence of substance use, substance use disorder, and any of the consequences of substance use like overdose? So this is the linear trend since only 1990 in deaths from substance use disorders in the United States. And this is the trend in specifically illicit drug overdoses during that same time. So death from substance use disorders isn't just from overdose. It can be from um, organ damage from the effects of substances. It can be from accidents that happen under the influence of substances. But we can see that rates of substance use and its consequences have only continued to increase since the government tried to crack down um, using punishment and incarceration. So the picture of substance use in the United States today suggests that the most common drugs that people use regularly are the ones that are most legal and accessible, so alcohol and nicotine. Marijuana is the third most commonly used drug and its use is increasing. So right now about 8% of people regularly use marijuana. And the reason for this is pretty simple. Marijuana is becoming a lot more accessible. Um, most states and municipalities have decriminalized possession of some amount of marijuana. And as we know, in a lot of states, marijuana is either medically or fully recreationally legal. In terms of opioid use, um, prescription painkiller use is the most common type of opioid use disorder, much more common than the use of street drugs like heroin. So overall, about 56% of people use one or more, one or more, sorry, legal drugs. Um, and about 10% of people use illicit drugs. And even though marijuana is legal in many places, that figure includes marijuana use. Oops, sorry. Okay. So the reason that alcohol, tobacco, and marijuana are the most commonly used drugs is really simply just because they're the most accessible. Um, and this is true for other substances too. So access to, to a substance and its availability in a community is probably the main predictive factor of how common its use is. So this figure here shows that opioid use, um, opioid use disorders in the purple line are really tightly correlated with sales of opioids by drug companies to pharmacies and physicians. And the types of um, over-the-counter opioids that are most readily accessible are the ones that are the most commonly used. Much more, again, much more commonly used than um, processed street drugs like heroin. So this figure is the most up-to-date US map of states where marijuana is legal um, after the 2020 election. Where I think in the 2020 election, I, New Jersey, New Mexico, and I think Arizona all legalized marijuana. Um, interestingly, even in states where, like Alabama, where marijuana use is fully illegal, you may have noticed like increases in the sale of um, CBD products, so other cannabinoid products that don't contain THC. This actually happened after the Farm Bill was passed in 2016 with language specifically making it legal to sell hemp products and cannabinoid products that don't contain THC. So historically, hemp sales and CBD sales were mostly illegal or at least very tightly regulated in the United States because of its association with THC. 
but not all hemp plants and not all strains contain the cannabinoid THC. So after the 2016 Farm Bill specifically made it legal to trade hemp products across state lines, states like Alabama now allow the sale of CBD products that don't contain a lot of THC. The limit is 0.03 milligrams. So marijuana is kind of an interesting case study in this relationship between the availability of a substance and the prevalence of misuse of that substance. So now marijuana is legal in about 50% of the states. So we can kind of ask the question, has legalization led to increased marijuana use? And has that been associated with evidence of increased marijuana abuse in the form of um, cannabis use disorder? So based on this meta -anal or this um, study of cannabis use disorder in states where marijuana is and is not legal and comparing prevalence of marijuana use in states where marijuana became legal right before and right after legalization, there's some slight evidence that marijuana use has increased for um, adults only. These odds ratios, I won't explain the math behind it, but basically the confidence interval includes zero, which means that we can't be at least 95% sure that the true increase in their use in the use of uh, marijuana products among adolescents and young adults has changed at all between um, when marijuana was about to be legalized and when it became legalized. But there has been a definite increase in adult use of marijuana. Um, similarly, there's only evidence for increases in frequent use among adults. And there's only really even kind of substantial evidence for increases in cannabis use disorder among that same age range. There's this confidence interval doesn't include zero. So there's also some evidence that the prevalence of marijuana use disorder has increased in adolescents too. So basically what this is showing is that yes, there has been an increase in use, but only among people who probably have like enough money to afford legal marijuana, which is really expensive and who are old enough to legally purchase it. There is less evidence of an increase in younger age groups. And there's some evidence of an increase in the prevalence of cannabis use disorder, but it's still very rare. So only about a one to two and a half percent prevalence in the United States. Okay, so the case study of um, marijuana legalization and cannabis use disorder offers some evidence that increase in availability of a substance does increase the prevalence of use disorders for that substance. And again, this is pretty clearly illustrated here um, in this figure showing that of the 8.4% of United States adults over 18 um, who have substance use disorder, alcohol use disorder is by far the most common substance use disorder because alcohol is the most common and easiest to get, or sorry, drug of abuse, legal substance. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the effects of alcohol and um, the consequences of alcohol use disorder. And I'm focusing on alcohol because it's the most used and abused substance in the United States. And because people in your demographic, college students are the most likely to be heavy users of alcohol and young adulthood. So 18 to 25 is the average age of onset for alcohol use disorder. So when regular heavy use becomes problematic use. I also wanna talk about alcohol because even though it's legal and widely accessible, it's actually considered the most damaging drug to both society and the user. Um, it's particularly more damaging to society um, compared to every other drug of abuse. And it's even, um, it's sorry, it's the most damaging drug to society compared to all other drugs of abuse. And it's the fourth most dangerous drug to the user after heroin, synthetic opioids, crack, and methamphetamine. Um, in terms of damage to the user, alcohol is terrible for sleep, it's bad for all of your organs, um, and it, it, alcohol intoxication is one of the number one reasons for things like fatal car accidents, household accidents. As many as 20% of emergency room visits are attributable to the effects of alcohol, and almost 50%. Um, of Americans will experience some kind of negative life event, accident, or illness because of alcohol in their lifetimes. So 
one reason why we tend to underestimate the harmful effects of alcohol is because of basically cultural beliefs and um, practices surrounding alcohol use. So this figure illustrates the diminishing returns of drinking. This figure suggests that the point where um, the positive euphoric stimulating effects of alcohol sort of plateau and the dysphoric depressant effects of alcohol start to kick in happens around a blood alcohol content of 0.05. So alcohol is this interesting substance because at lower levels, it tends to make people feel more happy, more social, more excited, less anxious, less inhibited. This is the type of drinking that makes people feel like they're more fun at parties, like they're better dancers, like dates are more enjoyable. Beyond about a blood alcohol content of 0.05 to 0.08 though, alcohol kind of starts to have the opposite effect. It makes you feel sad, it makes you feel irritable, it makes you socially withdrawn, and it makes you physically uncoordinated and clumsy. This plateau and change in the, in the effects of alcohol is kind of contrary to popular beliefs and the way that alcohol intoxication is sometimes portrayed in the media, which would suggest that the positive fun effects of alcohol only increase the more that you drink. So the phases of alcohol intoxication basically track this curve of diminishing returns. Phase one, disinhibition is the fun part of drinking, where alcohol makes you more confident, more friendly, and it makes your mood better. It makes you feel euphoric. Phase two is the diminishing returns called the depression phase. This is where alcohol starts to make you feel tired and lethargic. It's where your mood starts to become depressed. It's where your ability to pay attention to things and your judgment start to decline and where your motor skills start to become impaired. The third phase is acute alcohol intoxication. And this is when drinking alcohol actually becomes dangerous. It can lead to things like blackouts, um, coma, respiratory failure because of its depressant effects on the nervous system. So alcohol use, like I said, is super common. About 56% of people are regular users. Um, about 27% of people, so almost a third of people, binge drink at least once a month. Um, binge drinking is technically defined as any episode of drinking that gets your blood alcohol content above 0.08. Um, almost 10% of people are heavy drinkers, which means that they have at least five episodes of binge drinking in a month. And the lifetime prevalence of alcohol use disorder is surprisingly high at almost a third of Americans meeting criteria for alcohol use disorder at some time in their lives. So as I mentioned, adolescents and young adults are at an age where drinking behavior, heavy drinking can actually be fairly normative, um, so not deviant. That was the topic of one of the early assignments for this class, deciding whether a specific college student's um, heavy drinking was problematic or not. This is the age group where there's kind of an inflection point. Some people drink heavily in a normative way, and then that trajectory goes down. Um, their substance use decreases. There's other people who drink heavily in a normative way, but then continue to drink that way or escalate their drinking beyond normative levels. So the typical developmental pattern of alcohol use is that binge drinking and heavy drinking tend to decline by the time a person is in their mid-20s. What we know about risk factors for going on to have alcohol use disorders is that people who drink more heavily, especially starting at younger ages, so adolescents, and who don't show this slowing trajectory of alcohol use as they approach their mid-20s are more likely to have alcohol use disorders later in life. Okay, so for the readings and the rest of this lecture, I'm going to just go over some of the terminology of addiction and substance use disorders that I'll be using. So in the next lecture, I'm going to talk about initiation, which we can sort of think about as the precipitating factor, the precipitating time period in the onset of substance use. Initiation refers to the time when someone is first beginning to use a substance and when they're becoming introduced to a substance. Use just means taking the substance and having its psychoactive effects. Use can be problematic or normative. Binging or heavy use depends on the substance, but with alcohol, binge drinking is considered having four to five drinks within about two hours. Any drinking that gets your blood alcohol content above about 0.08, so the point of alcohol depression to intoxication, 
Um, and then have uses considered, again, binge drinking five or more times a month. Problematic use is any substance use that has any negative consequences. Intoxication refers to the acute effects of using substances on thought, behavior, emotions, and perception, and also on physical functioning. What we're gonna talk about in the rest of this lecture is tolerance and withdrawal. So tolerance refers to the phenomenon where users over time start to need a higher dose to achieve the same level of intoxication that they used to get from a lower dose. Withdrawal refers to the psychoactive effect of not using the substance, which perpetuates the use of substances because it means that people start to need to take the substance in order to avoid uncomfortable or sometimes even dangerous withdrawal effects. Substance abuse refers to a pattern of recurrent problematic or heavy use. Um, and substance dependence refers to the experience of tolerance, withdrawal, intense cravings for a substance, which we'll talk about in the third and final lecture, um, and the physical or psychological inability to stop using. Historically, substance use disorder was classified according to severity. Um, so it was considered a more severe disorder called substance dependence when a user experienced tolerance or withdrawal from a substance. So the older belief was that abuse is just any kind of use that has negative consequences, but when abuse becomes more serious and more um, severe, this is when tolerance and withdrawal start to develop. So historically, the DSM made a distinction between problematic use and problematic use with tolerance and withdrawal. Um, we no longer make this distinction in the DSM because of basically replicated evidence from multiple studies of substance users that have shown that the presence of tolerance and withdrawal in and of themselves don't actually increase the distress, the dysfunction, or the danger of substance use. In and of themselves, they're not signs of more severe use. They are more likely to be present in severe users, however, but that's only because the more severe someone's use is, the more likely they are to have any symptom of substance use disorder. So now we no longer make a distinction between users who do and don't experience tolerance and withdrawal. Um, and this actually helps to classify the severity of substance use disorder more accurately. So I'm gonna talk more about substance use initiation in the next lecture, but interestingly, um, over the early 2000s and still somewhat continuing to till today, although with minor upticks during COVID, substance use in teens has been trending downwards. Um, basically for every substance, but particularly for alcohol, which is the most commonly used substance by adolescents, um, less of a downward trajectory is evident for marijuana. But alcohol and tobacco are definitely decreasing in prevalence among teenagers. The most common pattern of initiation for substances is beginning with alcohol and then progressing to tobacco and marijuana. So this perception that marijuana is some kind of gateway drug, that using marijuana is the thing that will like cause people to initiate the use of quote unquote harder drugs is really not true. The vast majority of substance abusers start with alcohol and progress to tobacco. And again, this is mostly just because that's how um, these drugs break down in terms of accessibility for teenagers. The average person who uses substances was first initiated, so first experienced substance use by early adolescence, so around 14 to 15. But for some, initiation can happen as early as nine or 10 years old. So as this figure shows, teen initiation rates are declining over time, which is positive because the earlier someone initiates substance use, the more likely they are to develop a substance use disorder later in life. So finally, I'm gonna to get to the substance use disorder criteria. Um, and I'll remind you about this distinction between this distinction we no longer make between substance use and substance dependence. So when assessing for substance use disorder, the questions that we ask are, have you ever had times when you ended up using more of the substance or using it for longer than you intended? Um, has there ever been a time when you wanted to cut down or stop using, but you couldn't do it? Do you ever spend too much time using substances or too much time being sick or dealing with the after effect of using substances? Have you ever experienced a craving or a strong need or urge to use? Has using or being sick from using ever interfered with your home, family, job, or school? So has use caused dysfunction? 
have you continued to use even though it was causing dysfunction in your life? Have you given up or cut back on other activities that used to be important or interesting because um, they got in the way of your substance use? Have you ever gotten into situations while using or after using that made you more likely to get hurt? So is substance use dangerous? Have you continued to use even though it was making you feel depressed or anxious or exacerbating another health problem or after having a blackout in the case of drinking? So use despite negative consequences. Have you ever had to use much more than you once did in order to get the effect that you want or found that your usual number of drinks or doses had less of an effect than before? So this is tolerance. And have you ever had withdrawal symptoms like insomnia, shakiness, irritability, anxiety, restlessness, nausea, or sweating? So tolerance and withdrawal. And again, we used to make a distinction between substance users who had any of these symptoms, but not tolerance or withdrawal, and users who had either tolerance or withdrawal. But we know now that tolerance and withdrawal aren't necessarily signs of a more serious substance use problem. And this actually has a lot to do with individual physiological responses to substances and the degree to which they experience physiological tolerance and withdrawal, which I'll talk about later. Um, but it also has to do with substance. Not all substances promote the same amount of tolerance and withdrawal, but their use can still be problematic in other ways, dangerous, distressing, dysfunctional. So takeaways for substance use criteria is that they involve escalating use, desire to but difficulty controlling use, experiencing cravings, using despite consequences, dangerous behavior during use, tolerance and withdrawal. So substance use disorders are among the most deadly psychological disorders. Um, consequences include death by overdose or organ damage. Um, using substances and being intoxicated acutely makes you more likely to be a victim of violence. It makes you more likely to get into accidents, have risky sex, experience unplanned pregnancy. Substance use during pregnancy can cause teratogenic injuries to fetuses um, because of prohibition, but also because being intoxicated can make people do other illegal things. Um, substance use increases a person's risk of incarceration. And substance use contributes to mortality from a range of diseases, including cancer, diabetes, um, liver disease, heart disease, lung disease. This map shows the rates of overdose, overdose deaths in the United States. This is um, the most recent figure I could find for 2018. We do know that overdose um, prevalence and deaths increased the most dramatically that they ever have in the year 2020 um, during the coronavirus pandemic. The vast majority of substance overdose deaths are caused by synthetic opioids, so prescription painkillers, heroin, fentanyl. Okay, so for the last little bit of this lecture, I'm going to talk about the development of tolerance and withdrawal. So like I said, I'm kind of beating this point to death, but historically tolerance and withdrawal were considered more um, severe signs of substance use disorder. But there's no evidence that the presence of tolerance and withdrawal specifically tracks severity. And so now severity is just determined by the overall number of substance use disorder symptoms a person has. So as symptoms, tolerance and withdrawal aren't a sign of more serious substance use disorder, but they are perpetuating factors, helping to explain why people continue to use substances. Tolerance um, reinforces, so uh, negative, or sorry, positively reinforces escalating use, and withdrawal negatively reinforces continued use or use despite negative consequences. So, I wanted to try to bring in some first person perspectives into this lecture. So that these are posts from the subreddit crippling alcoholism. So this person talks about lying to everyone close to them in order to sit alone at a bar and get wasted, getting up the next morning ridden with anxiety until they get through the day only to go to the same bar, sit in the same chair and get wasted alone. This person talks about um, dating someone new who's nice but they don't think they're ready to be in a relationship. They don't understand how bad the poster's substance use is. Um, the person tried to drink socially, but wound up going on a drinking binge and spending the whole weekend drinking. I don't wanna be with this new girl, it's going to hurt her feelings. I don't know why I'm making these stupid choices. My blood alcohol content just hit zero and I'm shaking like a leaf in the bathroom stall at work. So these um, perspectives on the experience of alcohol use disorder both include mentions of withdrawal symptoms, 
So alcohol withdrawal, which can happen really quickly because your body metabolizes alcohol relatively fast. So it can happen relatively quickly after use include anxiety, um, insomnia, and shaking. Okay, so we'll talk in a second about the physiological underpinnings of tolerance and withdrawal because they do exist, but research actually shows that the biggest contributor to the experience of tolerance and withdrawal is actually classical conditioning. So this is the behavioral model of tolerance and withdrawal. The idea here is that substance use, which is the unconditioned stimulus, has direct effects on the central nervous system. In the case of alcohol, those are depressant effects. Substance use also um, causes the unconditioned response of compensatory sub or central nervous system activation. So when we take a substance like alcohol, its main effect is to suppress the nervous system but our nervous system naturally responds to that in an unconditioned way by trying to compensate for the depressant effect of the substance by increasing stimulant activity in the nervous system to try to counteract the depressant effect of the substance, in this case, alcohol. So those are two unconditioned responses to substance use. However, substance use is really reinforcing. And just like any strong reinforcer, whether that's the intense fear and anxiety that we have during a panic attack, or the enjoyment of eating that we get in contexts associated with food, the positive reinforcement. This reinforcement helps us to develop conditioned um, stimuli to, or conditioned associations with stimuli that are present in the environment during use. So over time, these conditioned stimuli start to have the same effect, the same conditioned response as substance use on the nervous system. And we can basically think about this as um, sorry. So the two unconditioned responses are the effect of the drug and a compensatory response, which reflects the body's attempts to maintain homeostasis. If we think about this in a sort of anthropomorphizing way, what's happening is that your body recognizes that you're about to use a drug. So it smells dirty bong water, or it sees you opening the fridge to get a beer. And those context cues, those sensory cues that have previously been associated with the um, acute effects of the drug and your body's compensatory response to that drug signals to your body that you're about to take that drug. So your body actually mounts a compensatory response in anticipation of drug taking. So the conditioned stimuli that are associated with drug use, when they're present, it causes your body to have a conditioned response that counteracts the effect of the drug that's associated with that conditioned stimulus. So this compensatory response is the key to the behavioral model of tolerance and withdrawal. So tolerance happens because over time, the body's conditioned response gets stronger and it starts to happen sooner in response to context cues. And as that response gets stronger, it starts to cancel out the physiological unconditioned effect of the drug. Withdrawal symptoms happen when the body goes into a conditioned compensatory response in the context of conditioned stimuli in the environment, but then you don't take the drug. So you're having this response that counteracts the effect of the drug, but without the drug in your system to balance out that response, you're only having the compensatory response. So you're feeling basically the opposite of whatever the effect of the drug would be on your central nervous system. And that is experienced as withdrawal. So behavioral tolerance and withdrawal are kind of the primary drivers of our psychological experience of both tolerance and withdrawal. But there is also what's known as metabolic and functional tolerance, which is um, a physiological decrease in the effect of the drug due to it actually having less of that unconditioned effect on your target cells. And this happens both through lower receptor expression. So as you're putting a lot of endogenous doses of the drug in your system, your body tries to compensate for that by producing fewer endogenous receptors. So it tries to kind of balance out the fact that there's more of the, neur the neurotransmitter in your system by producing fewer receptors to receive those messages. Your body also tries to regain balance and achieve homeostasis by increasing the production of enzymes that metabolize the drug in your nervous system. So those are metabolic and functional tolerance respectively. So withdrawal symptoms really reflect a conditioned compensatory response and they basically are the inverse, the opposite of the central nervous system effect of the drug. 
So because alcohol is a depressant um, and anxiolytic, the withdrawal effects from alcohol include things like anxiety, shivering, and in extreme cases, when the body's really mounting a strong compensatory response, seizures. For opioids, which induce euphoria and pain relief, withdrawal symptoms include anxiety and hyperalgesia, which means um, enhanced experience of pain, as well as nausea. Withdrawal from stimulants can induce tiredness, mental fogginess, low mood. Caffeine headaches specifically come from a compensatory vasodilatory response. Um, stimulants constrict your blood vessels. So when your body is expecting you to drink coffee and mounts that conditioned compensatory response, when you wake up first thing in the morning or when you walk past a Starbucks, what it's actually doing is um, dilating your blood vessels and increasing blood flow to your brain, which we experience as painful, as a headache. So the, the withdrawal effects from cannabinoids and other hallucinogens are a little bit less clear. And this is largely because we just don't study their use as much because they're not as common and because they're scheduled, so they're difficult to study. But it's seeming like withdrawal from cannabinoids from THC does happen, and it might include things like anxiety, sleep difficulty, and having really vivid dreams. There is, again, less evidence of behavioral or metabolic and functional tolerance to hallucinogens right now. So this behavioral model of conditioned compensatory responses and um, your body basically mounting a opposite response to the effect of the drug also helps to explain why relapse happens. So one of the difficulties of treating substance use disorder is the extremely high prevalence of relapse, as many as 90%, but at least 50% of people who are treated for substance use disorder relapse at least once. So what's happening after someone is treated for substance use is that they no longer take the substance, so they no longer have the direct effect of the substance on their nervous system. But as soon as they get out of rehab, they're back in the context where they used to use the drug. And all of the conditioned stimuli that might still be present in their environment cause their body to continuously mount this compensatory nervous system response that is uncomfortable, it's aversive, it can feel um, like withdrawal even after you've completely detoxed and have no more physiological or metabolic tolerance to the drug anymore. And that uncomfortable feeling, um, that conditioned compensatory response can prompt people to resume use. This model also helps to explain why overdoses happen. So interestingly, or not interestingly, sadly, overdose itself is kind of a misnomer because the doses at which people die from the substance are usually not that different from the doses that they typically take. So overdosing after a period of sobriety, like getting out of rehab, taking a normal dose, and then dying from an overdose can be attributed to both conditioned compensatory responses and to reduced metabolic and functional tolerance. But what's happening is that when someone uses the substance in a new context, so an unfamiliar place, or after they've broken the conditioned associations between stimuli that used to be present in the environment when they took the drug and drug taking, because they've stopped taking the drug for a long enough time, when they use the substance at their normal dose, their body fails to mount that conditioned compensatory response. So the drug has a much stronger effect at a typical dose than it used to when their body was having that response. Okay, so some takeaways from lecture 31. Um, substance use itself is very old part of human history. It's been happening since before the agricultural revolution. But when humans started farming and cultivating plants, we've specifically bred plants to produce even more psychoactive molecules. Government prohibition has been around since the early 1900s um, in the form of scheduling, enforcement, and outright prohibition, so illegalization and punishment of certain drugs. Um, it's a relatively recent phenomenon. And the rationale for it is that there is a relationship between how available certain substances are and how likely it is for people to use and abuse those substances. Initiation is most common with the most available substances, which in the United States right now is alcohol. In terms of the most dangerous substances, 
alcohol and synthetic opioids are by far the most dangerous substances that we use today. Alcohol is dangerous because of how available it is and how normalized heavy use is, so cultural attitudes, but also because of the physiological um, and toxic effects that it has on the body. And similar, similarly, opioids, the window of safety, so the window at which the drug is enjoyable and not toxic, is really narrow. Substance use disorder defines any use that has consequences, that escalates, that's hard to control, and that comes with the presence of cravings, tolerance, and withdrawal. All right, so I'm going to stop there for now. Um, I will see you in the next lecture.